No, Mary, just raise your hand. Be proud of it. Martha's. Oh, God, you just not cooperate with me. I just get louder and more obnoxious as we go. So we have Mary people and we have Martha people, we say. And that's a good thing. And it's a good thing because, you know, Mary people, what do they do? They notice the colors. They, they're, they're the artist. They, they get the abstract. They appreciate the journey. But what do Martha people do? They hold the compass. They have the map. They show you the way. They help you get there, right? So again, Jesus isn't rebuking Martha because of how she was built. Rather, he is celebrating that. He loves that because the truth is that both Martha's and Mary's are needed in this world. They're both important. In fact, in Jesus' eyes, Mary is not better than Martha because she wasn't serving, and Martha is not worse than Mary because she was serving. And so why is it that Jesus seems to be favoring Mary yet rebuking the hardworking Martha? Well, I'm glad you asked because I think I have an answer here, you see? In short, Mary or Martha's problem was not what she did, but rather it was how she did it and what she missed out on because of how she did it. In other words, in this scenario, Martha lost her, lost her way because she lost her why. She lost her way because she lost her why. Stick with me here. This is why Eugene Peterson wrote about this story. He said, Martha was distracted with much serving. And distracted means not paying attention. It means not having a center or an anchor or being pulled this way and pulled that way by whoever and by whatever. You see, in, in the church or in, the, in life in general, an important question to ask ourselves, and if you're not asking yourselves this, you should be. An important question to ask is, why is it that we are doing the things that we are doing? Have you ever asked that in your personal life? How about your church life? Would you dare? Why are we doing the things we're doing? In my first church, now this was kind of comical when I think about it now, but they were adamant that next to the lectern, not just in the pulpit area, because we have them here in the pulpit area, but they were adamant about putting the flag, the American flag and the Christian flag, right by the lectern. So when I would step up to speak, it was like my face was sticking out like this, and you couldn't see me if I moved this way, and you know I moved. I mean, I go side to side all the time, and I'm like behind the flag over here, behind this flag. Can we move these flags? Can we like stretch them out a little bit? And they were like, no. They told me no. And I was like, well, I just became a pastor, so I probably better accept that answer. Okay, I'll just accept it. This is my own survival. They told me no. But then later I got a little more cocky in it, and I was like, because I did this for months. I preached around these flags all the time. I'd had to go here, I'd had to go on the other side of the flag for even to see people. I was like, well, why do you do that? You know what the answer they gave me was? Because we've always done that. They've always been there. And that's but you didn't answer my question. Why are the flags where they are. Why do they have to stand in the same spot? You see, in truth, it's all about the why. Why are we doing the things that we're doing? And I say that because when we lose our why, it's inevitable that eventually we're going to lose our way. That becomes our God more so than God being our God, right? And in this scenario, it's clear that Martha has lost her why. Let me show you what I mean. You see, in this story, even though Martha did arrange the party and food and decorations, and thank God, I'm sure it was fabulous, right? But she got so wrapped up in the party being perfect that what did she do? She forgot about the guest of honor, Jesus. She forgot about being present with Jesus. Anyone ever seen the movie Home Alone? Do you remember that? The chaos of Christmas? And this kid's left by him himself in this house. Who was that kid? I don't know what his character's name was. It was Macaulay Culkin. And we know what turn, how he turned out just from the movie. Maybe I don't know what it was. It, it, he's not in a good place right now, or he wasn't. But in that movie, they were so wrapped up in Christmas and family. I got to do this. I don't know why I got to travel. That they left their kid in this house by himself. They lost the why. They lost their way because they lost the why. You see, when we get so tied up with the details, the, the way that we forget the why, well then this is, this is what can happen, church. I'm being very serious. This is what can happen. Resentment, jealousy, pride, 
shaming. You ever been shamed in a church before? Oh, you sinner. Sometimes they won't even say it. They'll just look at you a certain way. I'll shame you with my vision, my I see what you're doing. I know what you're doing. I'll shame you. And even some people, Lord forbid, can't imagine this happening, but some people will send people to hell based on some obscure passage that is out of context. And they don't even know what it means to begin with, just based on poor teaching. I mean, think about that. Isn't that really how things like slavery and misogyny and homophobia and colonialism, et cetera, all those things were not only accepted for a period of time as sound biblical teaching, but also in many ways to this very day, they're used as a means to not only keep people out of churches or banned or you know, shunned, but also out of the good graces of our Heavenly Father based on something they don't know what in the world they're talking about, right? You see, please understand what I'm trying to say here. When we forget our why, it can eventually lead us to not only condemn other people, but also make us think we can correct God, that we know more than God knows, which in truth is what Martha is kind of doing here. I mean, did you notice that? In this scenario, I mean, and this is crazy, but here we have Martha who is so upset at Mary that she even takes the audacious step to not only call out Mary, but she also tries to tell Jesus about how, what it means to be Jesus. Did you catch that? She's telling Jesus how to be Jesus, right? I mean, here, Jesus and Mary are sitting at a table, and Martha is putting out the cheese ball and the hummus and the unleavened corn chips, whatever she's putting out there, and she's tired, and she's sweating, and she's brooding, and she's ruminating, and thinking about this whole scene, even to the point where she's so angry at Mary that she even tells Jesus to go, shh, she says, zip it, stop it right there, excuse me, Jesus, I, I, I'll, I'll let you finish in just a second, but you need to stop talking right now because I have something to say, I need you to tell my sister that she needs to help me. Don't you even care, Jesus, what's going on here? So yeah, we, here we have Martha, who not only tells Jesus the shh, but then she also accuses Jesus of not caring. Jesus, Jesus, you don't care about this party, do you? Do you know how hard it was for me to put all this together? This party is for you, right? You see, it's kind of like this. In fact, it, this could be our sermon in ascendance, if you will. This is it. If the things we are doing for God aren't fueled by the time we're spending with God, study, prayer, communion, gathering with others, and yes, people going to church is important. It's gathering with others. It's an important thing. If we're not doing those things, well, then we will eventually begin to think what? That we are God. Have you seen it? Have you seen it before? Absolutely, it's happening. You see, the point of all this is not to shame Martha and exalt Mary. I mean, it's really not. Nor is it to shame any believer or church or denomination or religious expression. It's not that either. But rather, it's to realize that God is the only one who can make our crooked road straight. You get what I'm coming from here? God is the only one who can make our crooked roads straight. And he does that by showing us that there is a balance between being Mary and Martha. You gotta have a little bit of both. It's that whole truth and grace thing that comes right back into play. I mean, it's just like the song says, I pray deep for my soul to keep. The world has its own. Just like that, we need to realize that in this life, there are so many things that can affect our souls, our peace, our relationship with God and with each other, right? These distractions, things like what? Social media, you know, I'm like a dog that and spend a lot of time on it, but we know it's true. The internet altogether, news blogs, Lord TV. Anyone watch the news anymore? I mean, just this morning, we see countries being bombed. We see people that have mass shootings everywhere. That was the, this morning's report. It will blow, it's PTSD from watching news now. It's just horrible, right? And yeah, we even are distracted by churches who think they have it all figured out. You ever been in one of those places? They have it all figured out. Everything is right, neat and tidy. Just pull the slot, and I'll give you an answer for any question that you have. It. We know all the answers, right? That's what some churches will say. 
You see, friends, this is not an anti-social media, let's go out and build a butter churn kind of message this morning, right? We're not doing that, but rather, this is a message that is asking the simple question, the same one the song asked. It says this, when it comes to our application of the faith, who moves? Who moves? Who moves? In other words, when it comes to the core of the gospel message, why is it? That so many places of worship profess Jesus as the answer. Yet when you look closer at what they're saying, there's always that small, fine print, right, that kind of eliminates some of us, I would dare say most of us, from God's grace. I mean, it's kind of like this. We kind of have a policy with a blessing box. People periodically drop literature in there, but I usually take it out, okay, and, and you know, file it. And I, I got one the other day, and I saw it, I read it, and it said, it was beautiful on the front. It said, Jesus loves you, and Jesus does love you. If you don't know that, Jesus does love you. But the front of this says, Jesus loves you. And then I turned it over. You know what the back of it said? If you don't do, you will burn in hell. Jesus loves you, you will burn in hell. And, of course, I burned it in the trash can, and it right up, I slammed it two points right away, Okay. You see, when it comes to Jesus, you need to know this plain and simple. Jesus loves you, okay? If you didn't know that, I'll sing the song for you after church, not right now. Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And so what that means is that Jesus doesn't love you because you bake the best casseroles. I love you because you bake the best casseroles. I do, but that's me. Jesus doesn't love you because of that. Keep baking those casseroles and deliver them to 195 Pleasant Street. We appreciate them. We love them, but that's not why Jesus loves you. And Jesus doesn't love you because you've memorized the Bible, okay? And Jesus doesn't love you because you're United Methodist or Global Methodist or Baptist or Catholic or Republican or Democrat. That's not why Jesus loves you. Do you know why Jesus loves you? Because you're you. No one is youer than you. Jesus loves you because you were created by the hands of a loving God. That's it, and that's all. You see, in a world that likes to link being busy with being right with God, we just need to realize that the system is rigged, okay? It's not in our favor. You'll never win that game because it, being busy will only lead us to higher levels of anxiety and trouble and further busyness. It's, it's all it'll do. You know, busyness will beget busyness. For example, for some reason, our culture has tried their best to convince us that being busy is better than being present. Have you noticed that? I mean, if you just ask somebody, I can name a handful of people now, if I went and asked them right now, how are you doing, you know what their answer would be? I'm busy. I'm exhausted. I'm just overwhelmed. I'm slammed. But seldom, when I ask that question, do I hear people say, you know what? It is well with my soul. God is good. Everything's wonderful. I'm just glad to be here. You see, being busy is a choice. Being busy is a state of mind. In fact, being busy is a lie that we can, we can easily, easily get pulled, pulled into. In fact, when we do that, we feel like we have to jump from lily pad to lily pad to lily pad. And then as we're doing that, we're thinking about the other things that we have to do, right? But you see, one of the ways that Jesus makes our crooked road straight is by teaching us by his own example about the gospel of being present. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you think about Jesus' life and Jesus' schedule for a moment, I mean, Jesus was pretty busy, right, wouldn't you say? I mean, Jesus had this whole uh, i got to save humanity kind of thing uh, kind of weighing him down. And so he was busy. Of course he was busy. But what did he do? Well, he found balance. I mean, yeah, it's true that Jesus healed people and taught these sublime lessons and profoundly changed lives, but Jesus was also not above doing what? Going to a wedding. He'd stop and go to a wedding, and when they ran out of wine, what did he say? Well, here's, here's some Chardonnay for you, right? It's the best. I, it's a good year. Trust me, you'll enjoy that. It's good. Or when Jesus was walking through the busy streets, and he had places to go and people to see, what did he do when someone pulled on his garment? Did he keep going and say, I'm God, get off of me. Come on, I've got things to do. He stopped, and he healed, and he talked. He was present, and it was the gospel of being present. You see, when God says he will make our crooked paths straight, 
We need to understand that he doesn't want us to forget the crooked roads. That's not what God is saying. God wants us to remember. It's much like, I know everyone in here loves the Wizard of Oz, right? Anyone, any Wizard of Oz fans? You guys are here. Thank you, one person. Thank you, Jill, in the back. One person's answered me this morning. Wizard of Oz, one of the best ever. Think about that movie for a second. They're following what? Follow the yellow brick road. Hey, that was my best impression there. I was doing voices last night at a party. They're, Follow the yellow brick road. They're following the yellow, which is crooked. And what happens? Witches and trees throwing apples at them are out there and flying monkeys. There's flying monkeys that's messed with my head for the longest time. They're getting there, and they have this big poppy field. Oh, the poppies, right? And they had to get through the poppy field to get to the Emerald City. But when they get there and they realize that the, the, the biggest part of that whole thing was the journey, the journey. It wasn't the witches or the monkeys or the apples. It was the journey. Going home, there is no place like home. Crooked roads and rolling stones take me to my home. It doesn't matter that you've made some wrong turns because we all have. Some of us like me more than others. But we all have made those, right? And so my question for you is this. With the road you're traveling upon right now, where is that road going to take you to eventually? Five years from now, ten years from now, where are you going to land? Is it going to be a, a place that's full of peace, or will it be full of anxiety and fear? You see, the, the single most valuable currency we have right now is our time, the time that God has gifted us with, right? So how are you spending that? Are you, are you so busy doing whatever that you're missing the party? Or are you so busy partying that you're missing the servant part of that? You see, like an Eastern philosopher once said, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. Let me say that again because that's pretty good stuff, isn't it? It is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And so what is it for you? Is your path leading you to busyness or presence? The judgment and condemnation for others or to a quest where your soul yearns for God. You see, crooked roads, which is our path, and rolling stones, which really is a sign of freedom, the rolling stone from the, from the tomb, they do take us back home where Dorothy figured out there is no place like home. We're all on this quest, this journey to get home. But even so, we have to ask ourselves, is that what I truly want? Is that really what my life looks like? I say I want it. Is that what I'm exampling with my life? Or is it more, more important that my point is made, that I'm right, or that I'm busy? You see? In other words, who moved? Who moved? Jesus, the church, the world, or me? It's a question we have to ask ourselves at all times. When you're always right, that means everyone else is always wrong. And I, can, I, I know every one of you here, and I love every one of you dearly, and I know this too, you're not always right. You're not always right, even you, Carolyn. I see the face you're making right there. You're not always right, nor am I. Sometimes we just need to get over ourselves and give God the worship that God deserves because God's a lot better being God than we are, right? Amen? Let's pray. Most Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace and your love and your guidance. We thank you for this crooked road that we're all walking on right now. That will eventually lead us back home. You know, with sometimes we can, we can take some missteps and go in the wrong direction. And it will lead us to just some catastrophic things in our life. Definitely a, a detour that we'd rather admit, or omit, I should say. But Lord, thank you for the journey. Thank you for the path. Thank you for the things we can learn along the way. Thank you for us eventually getting to the point of realizing that the ministry of presence, the gospel of presence, is the most important thing. For time is our most valuable asset. We can do so much now in this life as long as we're pulling in air, as long as we're breathing. There's so much work we can do, but yet at the same time, we have to be present where we are. Wherever we are, we have to be there. So thank you for the blessing of that. Thank you for the blessing of the journey. And I pray that if any of us, you know, have ever had the thought of, you know, judgment or condemnation of other people just because of this or that, that, uh, that we take a step back and realize uh, maybe I, I've stepped, taken a step off the path. 
because God's grace always looks like the love who God is. God always leans into every situation with truth and grace. There is a balance, but at the end, God loves every single one of us because we are who we are, his most prized creation. For us in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Hey man, just a couple of reminders. Next week is All Saints, uh, our All Saints celebration. There will be some yummy food after the service, so come join us for that. It'll be a great day. Uh, we do have a finance team meeting immediately after church. If you're on that committee, we, we ask you to stay. I think that'll be a relatively short meeting, somewhat. Um, any other announcements before we close today? All right, well, let's pray. Most Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this, this day that we get to worship you corporately. Thank you for everyone that's here today, everyone who's watching on Facebook. We pray for those who are infirmed and couldn't be here today, uh, but they're still very much part of this family, so uh, we pray for them as well. And please continue to remind us that church starts now, that we've got a lot of work to do in this world, and you're counting on us to make that happen. So Lord, we thank you, we love you, you're an amazing God person. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you and have a great week.